Hello, this is a meeting of the Paraprofessional Program Working Group, the Licensing Subcommittee. I'd like to go ahead and start by taking roll. Brennelson? Present. Hamilton? Present. Judge Harper? Present. Torres Ambriz? Okay, I guess Claudia is not able to join us. And let, uh, let me just see if there's any um, public comment. So if there's one uh, attendee for this meeting, if you'd like to make public uh, comment, you can use the hand raising function in Zoom to indicate your interest in comment. So it looks like we don't have any public comment. Um, so um, let me just, as you can see, I've, I've advanced the slideshow to the, the first slide. And as you can see, I updated, I hope I accurately captured the revision to the educational requirements that were discussed at the last meeting, um, as well as the moral character and background check requirements, if you wanna take a minute to look at that. It's looking right to me. We give you an excellent job as usual. Oh, thank you. And then um, the other thing we discussed was just this, um, I think this didn't change, um, but we talked about this, we got more specific about the CLE credits for supervision. Mm -hmm. If you want to take a look at this um, and see if that makes, if that ref accurately captures what we discussed. I think so. Yeah. Okay. All right, and, and I think the other outstanding topic was just this question about trauma-informed representation. We, I did contact, and I think I mentioned in my email, I was able to reach the person who teaches that class at UCLA Law School. She wasn't able to attend today, but she is available for the next meeting. Um, I, I forwarded the article that I was able to find about including trauma-informed uh, training at, in the law school clinic setting. And the focus really of that article was on domestic violence and family law, but it touched on the, just the, this idea that really it might be relevant training for all practice. And I think that's what the, the argument that was made, I don't know if you had the chance to read that article, but that was the argument that the author was, the authors were making is that it's a good idea to just generally include it. So I don't know if you're ready to move forward on a recommendation with that, if you wanna, or if you wanna wait until after you've heard from um, this person. And I, and I, you know, the recommendation, we don't have to finalize the recommendation until just before the, um, we have to post it for the meeting for, the, for February. So um, I can go ahead and begin drafting the, your memo and sort of set that aside for now, unless you're already kind of convinced and, um, and wanna go ahead and include that. I, I assumed she would, uh, which professor did you talk to? Because there was two instructors. It's uh, uh, Cla this Claudia Pena. Okay. I assume she was in favor and supportive of paraprofessionals getting that education. You know, it's interesting because I reached out to her. I explained what we're doing. I talked to her about what, you know, and it was all via email. And, it, and, and then I, and I invited her to come and um, speak with us. And I haven't had, didn't get a direct response from her. I got a response from someone who manages her schedule. Oh, okay. So I didn't, she, she, as I said, she didn't respond, but um, so I don't know. I think, I think uh, the fact that the semester is just getting underway, at least for me, we're in meetings and then the semester teaching starts on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So perhaps this is a time where she's a little bit under in a crunch. Right, yeah. yeah, but she is available next Friday. I love that that article addressed vicarious trauma, the compassion fatigue. A lot mm -hmm. of my uh, 
psychologists and mental health professionals that I deal with talk about that. Attorneys have it, but we don't really address it for the most part. Um, so it, it's more than just the trauma that the litigant has. It's the trauma, again, vicariously that the, the professionals that help them experience too. So. Yeah, I, I read most of it and I, I found it interesting. I'll also say that uh, my nephew's working on his PhD and he's including trauma informed uh, education in public schools. So I'm completely comfortable including that in our recommendations now before we hear from the professor with the understanding that what she's gonna provide is really gonna be information for us to pass on as to what the course will consist of. Okay. Or if, um, you know, if the other committee members want to wait till we hear from her, I'm fine with that too. I, I can be flexible. Well, I, th I think Linda, you can feel free to get underway with it. Do we have mm -hmm. access to this PowerPoint? Cause I, I, d I don't remember seeing your updates prior to right now. Is this in the Dropbox? Um, I can put it in the Dropbox. I will Either do that, that or email it to us. Um, I can do both. Okay. Before we move on to this screen, can I, I, I want to have a initiated discussion about the ratio of CLE hours per supervision. Okay. Um, I always get, I always get the minors counsel and attorneys confused. It's 24 hours each year, right? Or 24 hours every three years, correct? 25. I think it's 25 hours. Yeah. Okay. So in my, in my mind, I want to encourage someone to be willing to take on all thousand hours, which theoretically would be completed, if not in a, in a calendar year over a 12 month period of time, a 12 month period of time for somebody. And if I look at the, it's a thousand hours and somebody needs to get earned proportionally eight CLE every year, I would think about significantly upping the hours of supervision. In other words, create an incentive for the lawyer to provide all of the supervision required for one paraprofessional and in exchange, they get all of their CLE, proportional CLE covered for the year. So Except instead of 24, it'd be like 125. So, yeah. so you're saying, it's, but that it still wouldn't take over their three elimination of bias, right. those ones. And wait, and you know what? It's two hours of CLE for 24. Maybe make sure if I want them to do 125 divided by eight. So you're saying they should get 25 hours of CLE for the thousand hours? Uh, I, yeah, I would, the, the ratio would be they would get one hour of CLE for every 125 hours of supervision. And if, and, and then uh, I mean, we're incentivizing them to do all of the CLE for somebody and not just doing enough to cover what they need for their CLE requirements. That's a Got good it. idea. All right. So one hour of CLE for 25 hours of supervision. 125. 125. Do you think that's for 125? Well, someone could have the choice of not doing, you know, it, it incentivizes them doing all the supervision and not pulling out. Like, what if they did? What if they did? Okay, I need eight CLE hours. So I'm going to do 96 hours. You can figure out how you're going to get your other 904 supervised. <laughs> No, I think the direct incentive is great that they're signing up to supervise this person through the program, you know, unless there's an issue between the two of them. But outside of that, I, I think that making it a direct correlation, they know what they're signing up for. And do we have you all put, I can't recall, parameters around. So if I am going for a certification in family law, housing and collateral criminal, my hours, my thousand hours have to cover all three of those topics proportionally. Like, have we specified that? We're no, I think it. we're- A thousand we're, hours per special, per area. Well, well, the only, we're right now we're looking at the model of family law. I think that for criminal collateral and all that, I don't know that they're gonna require as much as we are Stephen, it isn't that I would I would completely agree with that. I think Leah, I think that's a really good point. And I think we will do that. 
I think once we define what the different endorsements are, we would do something like for family law, at least half of your experiential has to come in the family law area. For collateral criminal, we could say at least 100 hours or 50 hours. It's not going to be much. So okay. we would do it. But we would do it by area, but I think we do it after we've actually got each of the 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 topical subgroups done with their job, and we could allocate it that way. But I would expect that. I think that's it might it, it that might be. In, in addition, I'm thinking about how some of the family law hours have to be. I think in a deep in a clinic setting, um, right? But not all. So right. it just might be a reason to think about the the CLE. Um, the CLE credit that someone's going to get, like, is it really accurate that we want someone to do all thousand hours with one attorney supervisor? Because if we want people to potentially be with a private practitioner, family law attorney, and spend some time in a DV clinic, or if it's, you know, if they're going for multiple certifications and we want to allow them to try to use their thousand hours, like proportionally. So I just, we might want to, think about that. I don't know. Can I ask a question? Because I'm not on the family law subcommittee. Are you guys dealing with this in family law that you're actually requiring the experimental to be in three different settings, Stephen? No, I think our cur the current status of our recommendations are that it include some hours in a clinic setting dealing with uh, <coughs> domestic abuse. Okay, because I was on, I didn't, I wasn't aware of that. Okay. So it, it just might be maybe an one hour of CLE for, um, for 125 hours of supervision, which I think is what you're recommending. Maybe that's the difference. Well, maybe it accommodates the scenarios. Yeah, I mean, if you break it down that way, then we can make sure that at the time folks are allocating what experiential requirements they want for each subject matter specialty, then they maybe we can put them in 125 hour segments. So like mm -hmm. if collateral criminal is not gonna require as much, they can only require maybe 125 or 250, like but that. then we then we use those in increment that, that becomes our, our increment. And what I would say to Leah, what we we would what we could do is for family law, I think it'd be completely appropriate. Like I had just suggested 500, but think about it this way: they can supervise up to four applicants at a time. If the family law requirement was 500 of hours, uh, 500 experiential hours with a family law attorney or a family law uh, law office, four students, um, 125 hours would give them all of their CLE for the year. Right. Hmm. If we took out, if we took out that you could get credit for multiple, uh, multiple applicants that you were supervising, then I would say, yeah, we could break it down. But I think the, the 125 works, we have because you're gonna be able to have up to four applicants at a time that you get credit, the CLE credit for. Well, we're here on the right side of this screen. It's saying five applicants. Is it limited to oh, four? Oh, okay. I misread. I thought it was four. My bad. I think it still works. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then that kind of becomes our benchmark when we're speaking of, you know, segmental and uh, experiential things. And you can take it into your uh, subject matter for family law and share with them that, you know, this is not necessarily the complete recommendation until family law flushes it out, but that would give them a heads up on how to view this, I guess. So then you can talk about if you want some of it to happen in a DV clinic, you can do that in, uh, you know, how, my, how many 125 in a DV or? <laughs> I just penciled out a number 200, I was thinking, because that would be four weeks full time. Well, I think we have to do it all in 125 increments now that we're that. Okay. that. Yeah. Um, so either 125 or 250. Well, but we can wait. We can wait till we hear what they finalize in saying the collateral 
criminal folks are going to do exactly. Do you, were you going to say something? Steve? No, I would, I think she's got a good point. I'm trying to figure out, I guess the unknown for us is what are the other practice areas going to require for their uh, endorsement specific experiential? Um, honestly, I think if someone was going to do family law, other than maybe adding collateral criminal or something that's not complicated, it really would be too much to take on. It's kind of like most we've moved away from the model of the general practitioner that does a lot of stuff. You probably, Judge Harper, you probably see a lot of more of less specialized firms, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So um, in, in the more rural counties, that's still the model, but generally speaking, you don't have family law lawyers if they're not in a firm that are also doing bankruptcy or tax planning or collateral criminal cases. They tend to just focus on the area. So I'm, I, I don't, I'm not offended by of the thousand hours for family law, 500 has to be with a family law firm or attorney and 250 has to be in a DVPA type clinic. And that still gives them 250 to seek any other endorsement. I can't imagine any other endorsement having the total hours that are gonna be required for family law. Oh no, I, I, I don't either and I think I, I think there's probably going to be a maximum of three endorsements that they can do the experiential with. I think, I think if they're going to take on family law, some of them are only are going to want to do family law. I don't know that they'll necessarily be interested yeah. in the other things. One thing that we are doing, Julia, though, is there, we still have this kind of protection of the person category that's currently a subcategory of family law, but we're treating it different in terms of what the the scope we we haven't got to the scope of services that they're going to be provided that so this would be like the elder abuse this would be guardianships and conservatorships that that might be one where it's going to have not as much but close to the number of hours on the bottom what's so, that sorry oh sorry so is so i guess my my question is uh you, so what you've done now in family law, because I'm unaware of this, is you're now thinking that in addition to family law, there's going to be additional requirements for assisting with elder abuse and guardianships, or those are part of what they're going to be able to do as family law, or you're seeing that as a different, a different specialty, a different endorsement. We haven't decided yet. We had exhausted our time in a little bit more last week when we, when we decided that we had to parse those out. My gut feeling is probably it is going to be a separate endorsement, but there's obviously going to be overlap with family law issues. That's okay. I just think that we need to keep the, as long as I understand the framework, that's all I need to kind of like get it straight in my head how I should be envisioning <clears throat> what may be an additional endorsement to family law. So if in addition to family law endorsement, and we're gonna require about 500 hours, then you're saying there are other things that have arisen in the area of family law, such as guardianships and those things, elder abuse, that could be additional endorsements if and and could become part of the thousand hours of experiential and technically they could maybe even get them at the same law firm yeah. right so and there's nothing that says they can't go for one thousand is the minimum there's nothing that says they can't exceed it if they want to have that broad of a practice right i mean sure yeah i like the way you're thinking julia it's almost like what are the additional endorsements that might go together so to speak like yeah. Family's the base. Then you can for this you can get um, conservatorship, guardianship. I think you all haven't quite decided to Stephen if um, protection of the purse, the not not the elder abuse, civil harassment, and DV is that a separate the, license the D, for that family? The the actions under the domestic violence restraining order or the DV the DVPA, the Protection Act. Those are going to stay in family law because those are decided in family law, law court where it's kind of like an other protection of person. So that's going to have the elder abuse, 
the workplace harassment, um, the civil restraining orders that don't involve domestic partners or relationships, the uh, gun violence restraining orders. Right. Okay, um, so that could be like an additional um, endorsement on family law and maybe name and gender change. I'm thinking about the things that maybe go together. And then in the civil world, we've got consumer debt, we have enforcement of judgments, maybe there's that that's like a package that you guys might consider going together, so to speak, and maybe name and gender change over in that civil side too, if you don't want to yeah. do it as part of family law. Yeah, I think if we, I think what we do is, I think it's going to be a separate endorsement. And I don't, I think that the protection of the person endorsement doesn't mean that they have to have the family law too. It's, it would be a separate, I'm envisioning a separate endorsement on its own, but the coursework and the experiential, there would be some overlap. But if you wanted the protection of the person, um, you would need to do your, your, well, I guess I'll call it the clinical experiential where you're working with the clinic. There are elder abuse clinics. There are civil harassment clinics, and that's where they would get their experiential for that endorsement. But it's also possible, Stephen, is it not that they just choose to do family law and they do all their thousand hours in that? Yes. So they, if someone is not required to do more than one endorsement. Yeah. Right. Right. And, and they, could do, they could do it where they started with the family law and that later on they could, they'd already would have the educational requirements met. Someone could go back to school and get the classwork that was specific to the protection of the person and get the experiential hours and two years after they got their family law endorsement could get the protection of the, of the person endorsement too. Are you thinking of perhaps also allowing them to test out of those things in lieu of doing additional academic work if they've already done it to re obtain one endorsement? Not testing out. If they did it as part of their initial qualifications, they've already met the requirement. If they didn't take, for example, if in family law, we have a specific course on domestic, uh, uh, I shouldn't think of what it would be. If there, is a, if there is a community property course that becomes specifically part of the family law program and they've either met the qualifications through their pre-paraprofessional program education or they took the course as part of the paraprofessional education, they wouldn't need to take the course again and they wouldn't need to test out of it to check that box for the down the road. If that was part of um, the, there's really not gonna be a lot of crossover though, Julia, they're really much different issues. Okay. Is there another category then we need to add for you all to deal with explicitly, which is, um, the class, because right now we have the class of eligible licensees is um, JDs, LLMs, certified paralegals. There's another class, which is certified paraprofessionals who are seeking an additional license. And so maybe we need to explicitly add that group and talk about what you would need to do if first you start with family, but then you decide you also want to do housing, for example. I don't know that because you we. You, they would already be a paraprofessional. It's just a question of what endorsements. So I don't know that you'd have to do that. I think what you'd have to be clear is they could seek additional endorsements at a subsequent time. And the only requirements they would have to satisfy would be the education and experiential hours specific to that endorsement because they would have done everything else. They would have done the background check. They would have done, I assume we're going to get them fingerprinted, the moral character, uh, the NPRE, they would have taken care of. Well, I think we're kind of at a, a at the point where we will need more guidance on the subject matters before we can contemplate, you know, adding in since we're we're at a loss as to how complex the other um, educational requirements for the endorsements might be. If we're looking at the model of family law, where you can test out of the first three units and then take the other three units perhaps as Leah can take to the other subject matter groups, the idea that, you know, if they're looking at having a three unit class on that endorsement, you know, 
is there any possibility that the person may be able to test out without taking the additional academic work or is it just going to be flatly required and the test to receive that endorsement but i think i think without i would say i would assume that the well maybe not for collateral criminal that there's going to be a three unit class they're going to have to take but I, I think we're almost to the point now where we're going to need some more guidance from the subject matter folks. Yeah. I would think, Julie, that they wouldn't be able to test out of something. They would be able to test out of something that they could have tested out if that had been their original endorsement. Well, I guess what I'm envisioning is, say, for example, as a paralegal here in my community college, we've had a uh, an expungement clinic going on. and say they've done expungement since the time they were in paralegal school and could actually take a test to demonstrate their knowledge because they've already had the experiential of working in a clinic on that specific topic. So right now, just maybe you can go back a slide, Linda. I don't recall, maybe I just missed this, that you could test out of the subject matter well, it was just the first three units that they could because of the availability of having family law as an elective in paralegal school to avoid having them to repeat what they may have done. Stephen and I had talked about how the first three units of family law could be uh, met if you could do that level of work already and then just do the next three units and you're done. Right, Stephen? Did I understand yeah, that correctly? That, that's what we discussed. The family yeah. law subgroup's not there yet, though, in terms of we're still defining okay. pra Can practice areas and, and tasks. Slide, Linda? Sorry. Can you go to the right slide for this discussion? So we, so we don't say here what you can test out of. Yeah, it's not in this slide. It's in the it was in the more elaborate. I, I think all it would be is in that second section that's white, that's educational requirements. Um, I, I think what it is, is we're expecting the, the, the subgroups to tell us for practice areas, how much, how many units that they need to have. And, and Julia and I had contemplated six hours for family law with the understanding they could eliminate three if they took a family law course in paralegal school or in law school. I think okay. that that uh, slide is in an attachment to our executive summary. Okay. Can I raise um, another issue that just came up in the regulation committee? Okay. Um, we were talking about uh, rules, the applicability of rules that um, right now allow attorneys to um, uh, provide loans to their clients. And then we were talking about advanced fees. We were talking about client trust accounts and whether or not they would apply in the setting. And there was some discussion about if any of these things are going to be allowed, um, there should be, you know, the state bar, for example, should provide a model uh, sample contracts that paraprofessionals could use and train on those sample contracts. And then it led me to think we don't have anything in our educational requirements around practice management. And this is an area where attorneys get into trouble all the time, um, just on managing client funds. And so I'm wondering, not to complicate things, but should we add a mandatory requirement for training on practice management? Um, Does have we, we could also maybe add that in with one of the other courses. I don't know that you're gonna want a three unit course on practice management. I kind of envisioned that as part of court procedure, court advocacy, you know, I mean, at what point do you do the contract? That's a really good idea, Leah. And I'm trying and to- I don't think it's three units, but I just think given what we know on the attorney side and how yeah. much problems people have, especially with client trust accounts, um, I don't know. Yeah, it just, 
Well, Seems maybe like we could add it either as part of the pretrial discovery and evidence and include it as practice management, pretrial discovery and evidence. You know what I think fell off this slide, this is my error, is the professional responsibility. Yeah. Oh. And so maybe it belongs with that. That's a really good idea. Because right now it's three units, professional responsibility, elimination of bias and something else. Yeah, that's Ethics. Great. Ethics, okay. So we could explicitly put practice management in there. Yeah, yeah and I, I just am, no, as we're talking about this, I'm realizing that that got left off of this slide. Okay. Do we have anything else to do on the moral character stuff? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. And I sent a, a bunch of documents related to moral character. Um, I think some of those should be included as attachments to the recommendation, but I don't know. I think probably the guidelines should be included. I don't know that we need to do, it was, it was really, really thorough what I, what I sent. It was a lot of stuff. It was a lot of stuff. And we're not um, dealing with fees or expenses that the paraprofessional is gonna have to pay, are we, as a subcommittee? No, I think she's talking about the client fee agreement. No, no, the, the, um, what I, the, I think we can use the moral character application that's used for lawyers for paraprofessionals. My question was geared when I was looking at the cost, you have to pay $551 to get that moral character checked on. And I want to know, is that the actual cost to the state bar or are yeah. we going to want to scale that back? Or is that even a concern for this subcommittee? I, I don't I don't know that it's a concern for the subcommittee, okay. but I that is based on the cost to the state bar. Okay. And that's statutory. Like you can't charge anything more than the actual cost. The okay. actual cost is going to be enormous at the onset, right? Because you're going to have very few relative to the cost of standing up the program. You're going to have relatively few applicants. So the thing we've thought about and that came from the DCA has been helpful in thinking through is perhaps like a loan from the state bar, the general fund, so that you don't have to charge $2,000 per moral character application for a paraprofessional at the onset, even though that, that might be the actual true cost because there's no economies of scale at the beginning. Gotcha. But I, yeah, I don't think that's anything that the working group would need to. Okay, thank you. Okay, I did also wanna update you. I had a great conversation on Monday with the president of the board of the California Community Colleges. And that happened because a woman that is connected with the chief um, named Hilde Agalidano reached out to Linda and I, she had had a conversation with the chief and at some meeting and, and where this program came up and there was this, you know, um, suggestion to reach out to us vis-a-vis -vis Hildy's position on the board of the California Community Colleges. So I had a conversation with Hildy and then she brought in the president just to start talking about how this program might actually be rolled out. And it was fascinating, Julia. Um, next time I talk to them, I hope you can join because it was really um, interesting to see De decentralized, perhaps not, ob perhaps obviously, but very decentralized system so that we kind of have to work with individual community colleges to get them to take up this program. It's not like an edict can come on high from the, from the board and, and, <laughs> and yes, it will happen, which is what I hoped I was going to hear. Um, so uh, some interesting questions that they had, you know, at first blush, these requirements seemed like a lot to them. So just to say that. And um, they also really wanted to understand how it was gonna be different from what is currently being taught in the paralegal programs, which I said, Julie, you've been asking consistently. Um, there was feedback that, that there was a concern this would draw students who are currently in the two plus two plus three program. If any of you are familiar, that's a pipeline program for underrepresented students from community college to the UC system to law school. They want to make sure the community colleges aren't sort of steering kids instead in students instead into becoming paraprofessionals, not 
becoming lawyers. So that was interesting. Um, anyway, so, so what I said I would do is pull together a one pager that they can then start talking with the, the chancellor and others, and they're gonna come up with a recommendation about which schools it might make the most sense to launch this in. Um, so I wanted to share that with you. I thought it was a great development, very interesting um, conversation earlier this week. Leah, did I misunderstand it? Did you also, did you mention it in a previous conversation when you were telling uh, Andrea and me about this, that they expressed concern that the eligibility requirements were pretty steep? Yeah, they, um, so basically they're thinking about it from a market perspective. They were asking me, and one of the things they wanna know in this one pager is how many people do you think um, all together uh, are character, could be characterized as folks with a JD or an LLM, or presumably who did not pass the bar, which is a population every, every year, right? And then do we know how many people are certified paralegals? So like, what's the universe of folks that would be eligible? Because that's part of how this has to be marketed essentially to the community colleges that we would want to pick up the program. They gotta know like how many people this is, where might they be distributed statewide? And well, we I, yeah. I think that you can get the, a uh, number of who would be available for the program by how many graduates you have out of the a a paralegal program statewide on a yearly basis or semester-wide basis. So we had to derive some of that survey work for the ABA in terms of um, how many people are graduating from the program. So I would think with all ABA approved programs and others that are not ABA approved, they probably still have those statistics as to how many are we putting out as graduates every year. Now I'll tell you, there are several that try and go to law school, but normally when paralegal school, we are not seeing the folks that wanna do the pipeline. They're already assuming that they don't need to be paralegals. They're gonna be lawyers. And why am I going to waste my time with you? So they, we, we don't see a lot of them until they go and then they may not make it through the first year. Then they come back to us. Mm -hmm. So I think that I see a lot of uh, law students who failed to complete the first year or they went a first year in an ABA approved program, they didn't make it. And so now they're going to uh, a state registered law school that is not as difficult perhaps. And so they're trying another program, but I've had someone do both at the same time. They're going to our program and going to a non-ABA approved uh, law school to try and see, can I pass the bar? If not, I at least have my uh, certificate so I can go be a paralegal. So I, I don't, envision that the pipeline is something that we'll be taking away from. Mm -hmm. uh, I think if for folks who think they're gonna be lawyers, they're, they really um, are kind of like how lawyers are about paralegals. They don't wanna waste their time with us. <laughs> they don't think it's as elite, I should say. And so I think, I think there's gonna be those that try, there's several every year that try and go to law school. I don't have many of them that make it. And quite frankly, there are folks that finish this program because you've got to get an overall C uh, to, to be able to graduate and get your certificate but or your AA in legal studies. But, you know, it's, it, we're pushing through a lot of folks and I, and I just don't think that that should be a concern that we're making something as an alternative available if they really have the wherewithal to get the law school done and make it and pass the bar. I think those folks are going to pull it off themselves. I don't think they, this, this kind of education many times ends up being offered to folks who tried to do bigger and just didn't make it. Okay. Well, I think what I'd love to do, Julie, I'm going to write something up and run it by you because I this is my first foray dealing 
with certainly any leadership at a community college. So I'd love to get your take on whether you think it hits the right points. Um, you know, they okay. want like a little pithy one page overview of what the program is, what we're trying to do and what exactly we would be asking of um, community colleges. That being said, they expressed all these different sort of concerns and questions, but they were very enthusiastic. Um, and we talked about the new Calbright, which is the 100% online community college mm -hmm. as, um, as a really viable option for this. So it was, it was, it was good. It was interesting. All right. Well, I, I, I'd be happy to help with that, Leah. Okay. So before I send out and, and, and save this to the Dropbox, I'm going to go ahead and um, correct the, what was missing from the educational requirements here, this uh, ethics and professional responsibility. And I think I'll add practice management just so that we have a record of that, even though, you know, from our discussion today. Okay. And, and, and will, are you going to add that to the Dropbox and I'll send it to you. Where it says testing, are you going to add in the subject matter specific testing and maybe parentheses put? May be able to test out of. Okay, so, I, I, I will add I, that, yes. See, see, for example, first three units of family law or something like that. Okay. okay. I think that's the only other thing missing here. All right. So it sounds like we will have the discussion next week with the professor from UCLA, and then maybe we will pause more meetings of this subcommittee until each of the other practice areas is nailed down um, and be specific with those other practice specific subcommittees that they need to weigh in on their subject matter specific unit, what they're thinking about in terms of subject matter specific um, unit requirements or course requirements. Does that sound accurate? Yes. And I think our goal uh, is for the February meeting to have our full recommendation from the subcommittee for the working group as a whole to vote on. Is that your understanding, Leah? I don't recall, but I don't think we're going to be able to do that if the um, practice specific recommendations are coming forward to the oh, subcommittee. that's true. Okay, okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Okay. I, I have a non PPWG question for the um, employees of the state bar. After we stop recording, can one of you stay on? Because I, I need sure. help. Sure. I, I can do that. All right. Thanks. So Lydia. are we are we finished with this meeting and adjourn? Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.